Good evening, my name is Paul, and welcome to my first video where I will be reviewing a video game. Now in this series I'm only going to review Nintendo titles, so no Xbox or PS4 or any of that stuff. Strictly N64, GameCube, Wii, 3DS, DS, Wii U, that family of games. And so, my first video, I decided, is going to be on The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D. But, it's going to be a two-parter. This part is going to be talking about why, or my thoughts on this video game from the standpoint of someone who hasn't played the original Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask for Nintendo 64. And then in a part two, I will discuss, if you have played the original, is it worth returning on the 3DS? So, for those of you that have not played a Zelda game before, the formula is typically split between the top-down 2D Zeldas and then the 3D console Zeldas. And this one falls into the console Zelda mindset. So typically what it involves is there are these big fields that you explore, and you typically have some kind of mythical quest that you have to undertake, usually finding some kind of sacred items, to give yourself power to defeat some dark omen, and you go through what's called dungeons, which are basically huge buildings with a lot of puzzles, some enemies to get through, then you find a new item, and that item helps you get through the dungeon so that you can defeat the boss of the dungeon, and that helps you continue the quest. And Ocarina of Time in particular was known for setting the standard for video game adventures, like period, not even by Zelda standards, but by gaming standards. And Majora's Mask came out only a little over a year later. However, as a result, it didn't quite get the attention that Ocarina of Time did because it was a very, very different type of game than what you'd be used to in the Zelda series. And even if you compare it to Ocarina of Time 3D, which came out four years earlier, in 2011, this game doesn't actually look that different. Fundamentally, it plays the same, looks the same, even most of the music is recycled as Ocarina of Time. Heck, they even brought back most of the old character models and just gave them new personalities. But that, aesthetics-wise, that's about as far as the similarities go. This is really quite a unique departure from the Zelda series, and even a very unique way of storytelling in an adventure game to begin with. Because the the main land where the game takes place isn't even in Hyrule, except for a brief chase sequence at the very beginning. You're in a parallel world known as Termina, where you quickly find out that the moon is going to fall in three days and destroy the world. Your objective is to stop the moon from falling. But in order to do that, you have to keep going back in time to the first day over and over again, like finding more places to save your progress, and then continue from there, earning new items, and then those items somehow survive the trip back in time, and then you use those to proceed further, so on and so forth. And admittedly, on first glance, it may seem a bit daunting, especially if you are new to the game, but thankfully the game gives you some really great um, ways in which you can cope with the ever-present, ah, there's a moon above me. First off, the the game requires you to save by going next to a stave, a save statue, kind of like A Link Between Worlds and Skyward Sword had. So if you're really, really flustered, you can just find a nice permasave spot. Also, there are two songs that you can play to either slow down time or fast forward to a specific hour. Because unlike Ocarina of Time, where there was just day and night, things actually happen at specific hours in this game. And you can even follow people along and watch their day-to-day -day routine for all three days. So there's quite a lot of nice characterization in there, too. But the problem is that those songs are very poorly explained on how you get them. Like, they're not even considered official songs, really. So, anyway. If you can find them, great. If you want me to tell you where to find them, let me know in the comments, and I'll 
say that in case there's some watching this video that don't want to be spoiled. So yeah, as you can tell, there's a lot of repetition this time around. You're definitely going to repeat a lot of the conversations you've had before. Rupees you might have found in a treasure chest will appear again, because they didn't survive the jump through time. And people that you've helped in side quests won't even remember you the next time you see them, which is kind of depressing. And especially the dungeons is especially exhilarating, because... Unlike games like Ocarina of Time, where you really have to look around and figure out the best way to solve the dungeon, this time around you've got a timer counting down when the moon is going to destroy the world, and you'll have to restart the dungeon. Thankfully, they let you keep the major item, and I think they let you keep the map and the compass. Admittedly, I've played the original so many times I've lost track, but... Um, you at least keep the major item, but yeah... You actually have to try to speedrun your way through the dungeons this time around, especially once you get to the boss battle. And you may be thinking, well, Paul, that's a pretty pathetic game if all you're doing is running around all the time. Well, thankfully the game has more than enough meat to back it up. What really sets it apart by Zelda standards is mask collecting. Like, the game has so many masks that you get an entire subscreen just to keep track of masks alone, in addition to all the other items you get. And since there's not too many new items this time around, which is a rarity by Zelda standards, a lot of the new items are really in the masks. Some of them are pretty simple things that just make you look different, and they change some conversations, while others have a few useful features, such as the bunny hood, which lets you run faster, or the Mask of Truth, which, which lets you talk to animals and the Gossip Stones to receive more hints. But then there's also Transformation Masks that turn you into entirely different forms altogether, which, if you've played Twilight Princess and you know how Link turns into a wolf, it's kind of like that, but a generation earlier. And... A friend of mine once got mad at me for spoiling what the forms were, so I won't mention them in this video. But if you bought the game in its boxed store version, you're going to see them anyway, so whatever. Anyway, suffice to say that they work really well, and they really uh, drastically affect the way that you move through the environment, as most of the, l most of the world is designed so that you have to figure out the best way to travel through it. And the same thing applies to the dungeons. Admittedly, there's not that many dungeons this time around. In fact, I'd say this game, by normal Zelda standards, this has the smallest amount of dungeons yet. But they're incredibly refined, and they're unique in the Zelda structure because there's not really a whole lot of, like, solving puzzles or combat. This time around, the prime focus is more on manipulating the dungeon so that you can get through it the most efficient way possible. And especially with the time limit thing, it really works. So try to figure out, like, okay, should the dungeon be this way, or should it be that? And as a result, it's some of the coolest level design I have ever seen. Like, seriously. I mean, you pretty much know that this is a remake of a, of a decade-old Nintendo 64 game, so... You'd be surprised to know that the dungeons are pretty much unchanged in terms of their design from the original game. So you'd be like, whoa, they had all this back in 2000? Yeah, pretty darn amazing, isn't it? Also, the game sounds phenomenal. Like, sure, they, they kept the soundtrack unchanged from its original version, but that is not a complaint in the slightest, as the two N64 Zelda games were known for having some of the best soundtracks of the 64-bit era. Also, the 3DS really works well for controlling the game. Touchscreen usage is pretty limited this time around, mostly just used for having extra item slots and um, equipping items quickly, seeing a map on the bottom screen so it doesn't clutter your view or you don't have to keep pausing every two seconds. Stereoscopic 3D works wonderfully. The game looks absolutely gorgeous. I mean, yeah, you can still kind of tell that it's based on a Nintendo 64 game, but still, like, the incredible amount of polish here makes it worth getting a CirclePad Pro if you're playing it on a regular 3DS or a 2DS, because 
the camera control not only helps you get a better look at all the the cool textures you can find, but camera control avoids that irksome problem Ocarina of Time 3D had of needing to center the camera too much. When I played through Majora's Mask 3D, I only needed to center the camera twice, and I believe both of those times were by accident. The camera control was so smooth that I didn't even need to center. And that's saying something, because there's a lot of games that have hit or miss camera controls, like Twilight Princess, for instance. And last, but certainly not least, the story. Is the story worth getting into a big deal? Well, most of you know that Zelda doesn't really heavily focus on its story to get the job done. Most of it, most of the Zelda series rely on exploration and puzzle solving. And this game is certainly no exception. But it's a different story in the fact that most of it is told via visualization rather than text. I mean... The game still refuses to have voice acting, which is kind of a Zelda tradition by now, but you'll find that the majority of how the story is told is done via the cinematics, which are considerably better than they were in Ocarina of Time. And you'll notice the game has sort of this interesting, like, kind of blurry effect, where you don't really know whether it's a dream or reality. And that's part of the fun of playing the game, is trying to figure out what exactly is going on here, because at first glance, it seems pretty simple, you know, stop the moon from destroying the world. But there's actually a lot more to it. Like, each region has its own little mini-story, and then all those stories add up into one big story. And it's really one of those, you have to see it for yourself. Like, don't just Google it. Like, really see it. Experience it. Feel the emotions of the people, or watch the emotions and try to interpret for yourself what's going on. It's it's kind of like the way some people have described 2001, A Space Odyssey. There's not really too much dialogue, but the visuals are the story. That's how I would describe Majora's Mask to you. So definitely give it a try, If especially if you're losing a loved one. I mean... The game is heavily based on the Kubler-Ross Five Stages of Grief theory, so you can find some pretty excellent coping mechanisms if you know where to look. And as far as accessibility, the game does a really great job of that, too. Like, despite the whole, like, time limit thing, the, the save statues are very well placed, and very early on in the game you learn a song so that you can easily warp to them. So you can essentially save anywhere, which is great for a portable game. Also, there's a Sheikah stone within the clock tower, which seems to be Nintendo's thing lately with their super guide trends. And you can crawl into that if you need hint videos on how to beat the game, because believe me, this is definitely one of the tougher 3D Zeldas that you'll play. And Link's fairy companion, Tattle, she's far less annoying than Navi, and she offers a few helpful hints every now and then, so if the game is hard, it's definitely not for lack of explanation, put it that way. And like I said, Ocarina of Time basically defined the adventure genre, so you really don't get very much more refined combat and exploration controls than this. So in terms of the sheer game itself, not even comparing it to the original, like should you buy it if you haven't played Majora's Mask? Yes! This game is the definitive version of how to play a classic, if you must get it on any platform. And it's a great game by itself. Definitely one of the more underrated and unique Zelda titles out there, and one of the most thought-provoking adventures out there. So definitely give it a try, and stay tuned for part two. Is, is Terminal worth a return visit if you've already beaten it on the Nintendo 64? So, thanks for watching. Suggest in the comments if there's any other Nintendo system games you'd like me to review. And until then, stay epic and God bless.